Hello and welcome to College Physics 1, Lecture 5, Describing Motion. So after a series of introductory lectures, we're finally at our beginning of our physics material. And so to begin, we're going to describe the basics of motion, which is an underlying theme throughout the entire course. You have a well-developed intuition about motion based on your experiences, but we'll find that some of the most important aspects of motion can actually be rather subtle. So as a starting point, let's define motion. Motion is the change of an object's position or orientation with time. Now, if I were to just ask you in passing, what is motion? I mean, most people would just react and think, oh, it's when you're moving. But if you say that, you're just repeating the word itself. And so you have to really think about what this definition actually means. So to move from one place to another means you're starting at some initial position, ending up at some final position, and it takes some amount of time to do that. So all of that information needs to be included. The path along which an object moves is called the object's trajectory. So the figure on the right shows four basic types of motion that we'll study in this course. In the beginning, here, we will focus on straight line motion. In later lectures, however, we will focus on circular motion, which is the motion of an object along a circular path, projectile motion, the motion of an object through air, and rotational motion, the spinning of an object about an axis. Note that motion is relative to the observer. Now this gets into some more tricky co concepts beyond the focus of this course, but let me just leave you with an example here that kind of, ex I don't know, kind of reveals how motion can be relative. Imagine that you are a passenger in a car. You see your friend standing on the sidewalk and wave at her turning your head to look at her while you drive past. She, too, turns her head as she waves back. We turn our heads to follow a moving object, so it is not surprising that your friend turns her head. Of course, because you're in a moving car. But the question then re remains is, well, why do you turn your head? I mean, after all, your friend was standing still on the sidewalk. But from your perspective, she's moving away from you. So this is where things can get interesting. The person is standing still on a sidewalk, but relative to you, they're moving backward, right? Because you're progressing forward. And so there's this kind of interesting dilemma you have to deal with. But again, we're going to leave that aside, and that's for a different course. So to better visualize motion, we introduce something that we call a motion diagram. That is a diagram which shows the position of an object at several equally spaced intervals of time. The real world is messy and complicated. Our goal in studying physics is to brush aside many of the real world details in order to discern patterns that occur over time. Stripping away the details to focus on essential features is a process that we call modeling. Thus, a model is just a highly simplified picture of reality. Models allow us to make sense of complex situations by providing a framework for thinking about them. Albert Einstein once said, physics should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. We want to find the simplest model that allows us to understand the phenomenon that we're studying, but we can't make the model so simple that key aspects of it are lost. So uh, to give you some examples of a motion diagram, here we have three on the right. A skateboarder that is moving down the sidewalk, and you can tell that they're moving down the sidewalk at a constant speed. We know this because the spacing between each frame is the same. So they're traveling the same distance in each amount of time. So this person is moving at a constant speed. Well, in the next situation, we have somebody that's running in a 100 meter dash, and notice that the frames get progressively further and further apart, indicating that the person is traveling a greater distance in the same amount of time. Well, if you're traveling a greater amount of distance in the same amount of time, that means you must be increasing your speed. So here we see an object that is accelerating. And in the last case, we have an object that is slowing down. We can say that the, per or that the car is slowing down because the spacing between each frame gets progressively smaller and smaller 
indicating a smaller distance traveled, so a slower speed. But this is still kind of complicated, right? Because if you were asked to make a bunch of these motion diagrams, well, you wouldn't want to draw a whole car every frame or a whole person on a skateboard every single frame. So, physics should be simple as possible, but not simpler. Well, let's try to make it a little bit more simple. An object can be represented as a mass at a single point. So the motion of an object as a whole is not influenced by the details of the object's size or shape. In other words, it doesn't matter what kind of car it is, or what shape it is, or even how massive or big it is. To describe the object's motion, all we really need to keep track of is the motion of a single point. You can imagine looking at the motion of a dot painted on the side of the object. We can also treat the object as if all of its mass were concentrated into a single point. Thus, we call that a particle. If we treat an object as a particle, we can represent the object in each frame of a motion diagram as a dot, while still conveying a complete understanding of the object's motion. Thus, we have developed a model for moving objects that we call the particle model. So here's a great example. Here's the example of the car slowing down. Well, instead of drawing a car for every frame, which is tedious, why don't we just draw a dot? We still see the same distance between each frame, and so the information hasn't really been lost. All we have to do is tell ourselves this is a car, and we suddenly know exactly what's happening. The spacing is decreasing, indicating that the object is slowing down as it goes from point zero to point three. So we have made a simplified view of our situation. Now, to better visualize everything we're discussing here so far, I recommend pausing this video and looking in the description on YouTube, and there is a link here that you can uh, copy or hyperlink to, and it's just like, I think it's like a 30 or 40 second video of an object moving in a video, and then it pauses the video every second, and then it replaces the object with a dot. So it kind of puts a visual um, example to everything we just discussed. Okay, so we now have a model, and we've gone through all our introductory material. Let's finally start defining some of the quantities that we use in physics. To develop our understanding of motion even further, we need to be able to make quantitative measurements. In other words, we need to use numbers. As we analyze a motion diagram, it is useful to know where the object is, and when the object was at that position. We'll start by considering the motion of an object that can move only along a straight line. An object's location at a particular instant of time is called the object's position. To be able to specify a position, three key pieces of information are necessary. First, you need a fixed reference point that we call the origin. So you need a reference point, right? How far away from something are you, perhaps? Which hints at my next point how far the object is from that origin. But if I say I'm 10 feet away from an origin point, well, that could mean 10 feet away in any direction. It could be 10 feet away to the right, to the top of it, to the left of it, what have you. So just stating how far away you are from that point isn't necessarily enough. You also need to include a direction from the origin as well. So all of this together with a set of axes forms a coordinate system. And the symbol that we use to represent a position is what we call a coordinate. So this image on the right is a great example of putting all of this together. The situation is a runner uh, running a marathon. And if we wanted to specify their position, well, we need these three things. A reference point. So let's say the reference point or origin is where they start the start of the race. Well, we need to know how far away the object is from the origin, so in this case that would be 20, looking at the units, meters. And we need a direction. Well, in this case, it's to the right of the origin. So we are able to exactly specify this runner's position using this coordinate system we have defined. Now one more thing before we move on, 
notes that coordinate systems aren't only horizontal, in other words, in the x direction. Uh, you might have vertical motion, so you could have something along a y-axis, such as the case of a rock falling. And, as we'll see in another week or two of our uh, course, you will see uh, tilted axes along the slope of an inclined plane as well. So this whole graph graphic on the top isn't particularly useful. It's basically for now just me saying, be aware that there are axes beyond just the horizontal. So to describe motion, we need to measure changes in position, not just a specific location. And so a change of position, which is represented by delta x, is called displacement. In other words, you have been displaced from one place to another. Displacement, therefore, is the difference between a final position and an initial one. We use the subscript f for final and subscript i for initial. Hence, the displacement or change in position, delta x, is equal to x final minus x initial. Note that displacement can be either positive or negative. So let me give you an example of each. Uh, this might take just a moment. So let's say I wanted to find the displacement for the situation above. So let's say I wanted to find delta x, which we know is x final minus x initial. So let's look at where they end up, the final position. Uh, in this case, the person's name is Sam. Sam is walking down 12th Street. Uh, according to the system, the final position of Sam is 150 meters. So for x final, I write 150 meters. Initially, their initial position is 50 meters. So if I wanted to solve this for the total displacement, we have 150 minus 50, which is 100 meters. Sam has been displaced to the right by 100 meters. Well now, let's look at a similar situation, also along 12th Street, but now let's say Sam is moving in the other direction. So let's find their displacement again, delta x, which is x final minus x initial. Their final position is back at the intersection or the origin, zero. Their initial position was at 50 meters. So notice something interesting happens here. We have a smaller number minus a bigger number, in this case 0 minus 50, which will give us negative 50 meters. So this is just an example of how a displacement can be negative. Okay, so a negative displacement simply means motion to the left. Okay, so it is possible to get a negative. Sometimes a student will get a negative value and freak out. Um, but you don't need to fret. It is possible to get a negative displacement. It just indicates the direction. Okay, well, this is only describing a change in position. But if we're talking about motion, there's another key element. And that is the time it takes to, take, to undergo that motion. So to quantify motion, we'll need to also consider changes in time, which we call a time interval. So the figure here shows an object that you should be able to recognize as slowing down, since the spaces are getting smaller from left to right. But, without any information about time, we have no idea what kind of a slowing down motion this is. For example, if the frames were a second apart, it would be a pretty leisurely slowdown. But if the seconds were, say, a tenth of a second, or if the spacing was only a tenth of a second apart, well then this represents something coming to a screeching halt. So a time interval, delta t, measures the elapsed time an object moves um, from an initial position to a final position. So again, just the basic definition of change means final minus initial. So a time interval delta t is t final minus t initial. Now note that in this case, a time interval will always be positive. Because, uh, at least according to our lecture today in 2020, who knows how long these will be online for, but time travel is not a thing at the moment. And so we can't go backwards in time, so we will never end up with a negative time interval. Um, if you figure that out, though, I'll give you some extra credit.
So this then brings us, if we put it all together, to speed. Objects moving along a straight line at a constant speed are said to be undergoing what we call uniform motion. It's uniform in the sense that the speed is constant and it's in a single direction. We're trying to start out really simple here in our first introductory lectures, so not to overcomplicate things and cause too much of a panic. For an object in a, a uniform motion, successive frames of the motion diagram should be equally spaced. The greater the distance traveled by an object in a given time interval, the greater the object's speed. Thus, we can define speed uh, of an object in uniform motion as distance traveled over a time interval. So recognize that this is only telling us how fast an object is moving. Distance traveled over a time interval, that's just telling us the speed or how fast something is moving. Uh, I won't write this one out because I'll do it for an example on the next slide, but here you can see for the first car, it says that the car has uh, taken one second to move 40 feet. In other words, the car has moved uh, 40 feet in one second, or its speed is 40 feet per second. Well, a bicycle here has only gone 20 feet in one second. So that is only 20 feet per second. So it's slower than the car. And you should be able to know that without even calculating it, just by looking at the picture and based on the spacing between each dot. So, speed again only tells you how fast. Well, we're going to introduce velocity now, and the fact that I'm giving it two different terms, speed and velocity, should indicate that there is something different between the two, even though they are often interchanged. To fully characterize the motion of an object, we must also specify the direction the object is moving, not just how fast. Velocity is what does that for us. Velocity tells us both the object's speed and its direction. So there's a very subtle difference. Remember, speed was distance traveled over a time interval. Velocity is displacement over a time interval. Or, because we know the symbols for these terms, let's represent velocity with v so that it is equal to displacement delta x over the time interval delta t. This is kind of our very first physics equation that we have introduced. Now, a very important point. This is only an average velocity. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say I start out by moving um, at a constant speed from one point to another. But then I do it again, and in the first half of motion, let's say I'm moving really, really slow, a really slow walking pace, maybe. But then maybe I realized I'm late to whatever I was doing, and so for the last part of the motion, I run, I sprint full speed to the end point. Well, if we just solve using this equation, that's giving us the average velocity of the entire segment from the initial to the final point. But it doesn't give you the information about traveling uh, slower in the beginning and faster in the second part. So this doesn't really necessarily help us look at any specific point in time. It's just an average over some interval of time. We'll look at the instantaneous cases later on. So let's look at the situation on the right. We have bike one, and let's say we want to solve for the velocity of bike one. Let's call it V1, the velocity of bike one. This bike moves from zero meters to, uh, or excuse me, zero feet to 20 feet. So we have uh, delta X over delta T, right? And remember, delta X means final minus initial. So the final position, let's say, is 20 feet. The initial uh, position is zero feet. Right? So we've gone in this one second from 0 to 20 feet. And, uh, spoiler, the time interval was one second. So the velocity of bike 1 is 20 feet per second. Right? So this is the velocity of bike 1. Well, let's look at bike 2. So let's say v2 is delta x, uh, we'll say x2 
x1. Uh, delta x2 over delta t, right? So in this case, how far did they travel? Well, they traveled 20 feet again, but be careful, it's to the left. So the final position here is the 100 meters, and the initial position is the 120 meters. All right, so uh, we have that, and again, it took one second, so one second. So the only difference here is we are moving to the left now. 100 minus 120 is also 20, and divided by the one second leaves it as 20, so we have 20 uh, feet per second. I keep using meters, I'm so used to using scientific notation and um, uh, our SI units. So this is supposed to be 20 feet, I'm sorry for the sloppiness here. 100 feet. That's really messy. I could just fix that, but it might take too long. All right, so, oh, that's actually quicker than I expected. So this is supposed to be feet, and again, I apologize for some of the mistakes here. Let me fix those real quick. So we've got uh, 100 feet minus 120 feet, and this was x1. So again, I'm just used to the standard SI units of meters in a class like this. I forget that we use feet and stuff in the beginning to get us used to it. So in either case, um, we have a negative 20 feet per second. Negative again, because we are moving to the left in this case. So this is the velocity of bike two. So both traveled the same amount of distance in the same amount of time but their velocities are different, one being positive, one being negative, indicating that they're traveling in different directions. So this brings us to the last topic of our lecture, vectors. Many physical quantities, such as time, temperature, and mass, can be described completely by a, simply a number and a unit. For example, the mass of an object might be 6 kilograms, and its temperature might be 30 degrees Celsius. A physical quantity described simply like this by a single number with a unit is called a scalar quantity. A scalar can be positive, negative, or zero. You can have a negative temperature, a positive temperature, and so on. But many other quantities have a directional quality that cannot be described simply by a number. For example, to describe the motion of a car, you must specify not only how fast it is moving, but also the direction in which it is moving as well. A vector quantity is any quantity that does have both a size and a direction. The size or length of the vector is called its magnitude. The magnitude of a vector can be positive or zero, but it cannot be negative. So, a scalar is anything without a direction, and a vector is anything that includes a direction, and the size or length of that vector is its magnitude. Graphically, we represent a vector as an arrow, illustrated um, such that it points in the direction of the force or speed or whatever have you, so it points in the direction of the vector. The arrow is drawn uh, to point in the direction of that quantity, and the length is proportional to the magnitude of that vector. So how big the arrow is dictates um, or symbolizes how much of the value it is, and its direction, of course, indicates which way it's pointing. So here we have two examples of vectors, the vector of this car moving to the right, indicated by the arrow, and the vector of this kid pushing on another kid on a swing. This is the force vector, the force that this kid is applying to the person on the swing, they're pushing it to the right. When we want to represent a vector quantity with a symbol, we need to somehow indicate the symbol is for a vector and not just a scalar. So anytime we're indicating a uh, vector quantity, we do so by writing a little arrow above the symbol. So for example, velocity is a vector because we said previously that it included not only the speed, but the direction. So, it's a vector quantity, so we're going to label it with an arrow above the V. Well, displacement is also a vector. 
since it has both a magnitude, in other words, how far you've traveled, the distance traveled, and the direction. Uh, so the image on the top here is a great uh, example of this. So here's a boat traveling down a river. Well, they traveled a pretty big distance. They winded back and forth, back and forth to get through the river. So they've traveled a great distance. But their displacement is simply the initial minus the final, or excuse me, the final minus the initial point. So we're only concerned with the starting and ending points for displacement. So even though they traveled this S shape, their displacement is straight across that. So a displacement vector is drawn from the object's initial position to its final position, regardless of the path that it followed between those two points. The net or total displacement for any trip with two or more legs is the vector sum of those that made it up. The magnitudes and directions of the two vectors must be taken into account. For example, consider Sam. Sam starts at the intersection and walks 50 feet to the east. He then walks 100 feet to the northeast through, let's say, a vacant lot. Sam's trip consists of two legs, but we can represent his trip as a whole from his initial starting point to his overall final point using a net displacement vector. So sure, he traveled to the right initially and then up and to the right, but we can use a total displacement from the starting to the final point to describe this person's displacement. So how do we actually add vectors? It's not as simple as just saying 2 plus 2, because direction matters. Sure, it might be 2 and 2 for the sizes of your vectors, but are they pointing in the same direction so that you can add them? Most likely not. So we're going to use what we call the head-to-tail method to add vectors. You might have heard this as tip-to-tail or something else, but the head-to-tail method is how we're going to add vectors. To begin, start by drawing your first vector. So let's say A is our first vector, and let's say it's pointing up and to the right. So you can see that here on the right-hand side. Step two, place the tail of your next vector, so B, at the head of the first vector. So let's say we had some random vector B, so we need to shift it around so that its tail is at the head of the first vector. So then our final step, draw an arrow from the tail of A, in other words, your starting point, to the head of B, in other words, where you ended up. This is the sum of the two vectors. Okay, and this works both ways. So even if I started with B and then did A, notice that here I'll start with B, and then I'll add an A, which is kind of up and to the right a bit. All right, so notice if I do that, then I connect the dots, the overall resulting vector is still something that is pointing down and to the right, just like you see here with the A plus B values. So that is how this head to tail method works, how you add two vectors together to get the total. Now, those of you in my actual class, you've probably already experienced this when we did our vectors lab. So you already have a bit of uh, an idea on how this works. We will elaborate this on the future, but for now, let's conclude with a few questions. So the way these work is that I'll present the question to you. I'll be silent for a couple seconds. Uh, I encourage you to actually sit and think about the questions, maybe even pause the video while you think about it, and then come back uh, and I'll give the answer a few seconds after I finish asking the questions. So question number one. Both cars have the same time interval between photos. Which car, A or B, is going slower? Okay. So in this case... What we're looking for is whichever situation has the spacing between the frames being smaller, right? Because a smaller spacing between the frames indicates moving slower. So car A is our solution. Car A has the smaller spaces between each frame, and thus we have the slower moving object. Object B here has bigger spacing between each frame, indicating that it's traveling a greater distance in the same amount of time, 
suggesting that it must be moving more quickly. Okay, same idea, except this time we have two runners jogging along a track. Their positions are shown at one second intervals. Which runner is moving the fastest? Okay, so in this case, we're looking for whichever situation has, again, greater spacing between each dot. It gets a little tough to tell kind of in the middle when the dots are all over the place, so it's why the beginning part is so important. Notice they start at the same distance, but one second later, A is a little bit further, another second later, A is even further away, and so on and so forth. So, A must be the faster runner. They are overtaking the position of B, right? So they start at the same place, A is ahead at the next point, A is even further ahead at the next one, and so on and so forth. Note that it tries to trick you at the end by um, including it such that B was the last value. It was just trying to get a trick out of you. Um, that doesn't matter. All that matters is the spacing between them for this discussion. Uh, okay, let's do two more. Question three. An ant zigzags back and forth on a picnic table as shown. The ant's distance traveled and displacement are what? Uh, note that the ant looks to be starting at about 40 and ending at about 10. So what are the distance traveled and the displacement of the ant? Okay, so if you look at this, the easiest way for me is to start with displacement. So I ask myself, what is the final minus initial positions, right? So we're looking for, say, delta x is equal to x final minus x initial. So the final position here where the ant ends up is 10 meters minus the initial, which was 40 meters. Thus, we get about negative 30 uh, meters. Well, there's only one of those that fits. That's option E. E is the only one that has negative 30, so we should technically, if we already know this, know our answer, because it's the only one that shows it. Now, you can easily make the case that your distance traveled must be greater because it's zigzagging. It travels some great distance to the left, then back, and then it continues its motion. So we know the value here should be larger. So we should be seeing the 50 option uh, for the distance. And you can try to prove that in the diagram. It's just a little bit tough. So the answer for this particular example is E. You have negative 30 centimeters for the ant's displacement, and so far 50 centimeters for its distance traveled. All right, last one. Given the vectors P and Q, which are shown at the top of the frame, what is the vector P plus Q? So in other words, what would this look like if they were added together? Okay, uh, so let me draw P, more or less. It's not gonna be perfect, again, just be patient. So let's say this is P, and I wanna add Q to it. I take the um, head of the second vector, place it at the um, tail of the first vector, hence the head to tail method, and so we should get something like this as a result, right? And so the overall effect um, for this particular situation is that your overall vector from the head to the tail let me use a different color, let's say green, is something that's pointing down and to the left. So we just look for which of these is pointing down and to the left a bit, and voila, we have A, something that's pointing down and to the left. And again, like I mentioned previously, you can reverse this. If you wanted to start with Q and then work with P, you're more than welcome to do that, as long as you're careful in setting up your um, directions of your vectors. Okay, uh, so that is our introductory material for physics. We have now 
taking a look at the absolute basics of what position and displacement are, as well as speed and velocity. In our next lectures, we start to jump into the meat of the problems. Um, so our next lecture, or three, is going to be about graphs in physics. How to deal with position, velocity, and acceleration on graphs. So until then, thanks for watching, and have a great day.